Hello everybody and welcome to this month's Contract Administration Practice Group. Um, my name is Matt Fox. Again, we'll be introducing you here today with Douglas Freeman and Jim Raines. Uh, so with that, I want to hand it over to Douglas and Jim to do any introductions and get going with today's presentation. So Douglas and Jim, over to you. Thank you, Matt. First of all, we want to say welcome to everyone for uh, calling in today. Hopefully we'll all have a good time and learn something as we talk about payment applications. Uh, we're going to break the topic up into at least two sessions. We will cover some items today and then pick up next month with uh, the AE's review of the application. And today we'll talk about some basic uh, principles that have to do with payment applications. So today we're going to talk about payment applications. And we'll start off with uh, talking about the roles and responsibilities of the parties. Uh, AIA documents is what we'll typically refer to. There are other contract documents out there. EJCDC is another common one. Uh, so we're going to use AIA terminology. I think it's probably more prevalent in the industry and keeps from confusing folks and going back and forth between different sets of documents. We'll just refer to the AIA and might uh, highlight some similarities between uh, the AIA and EJCDC documents. So uh, the contract documents are what establishes the rights and responsibilities of the various parties as it pertains to payment. That can be found in several different documents and they all work together. First is the standard form of agreement between the owner and the contractor. And on the screen you can see AIA document A101. There are other AIA doc contract documents and as I mentioned before other other out there other than just the AIA documents. And then you also need to look to the general conditions of the contract, any supplementary general conditions or other conditions that might be uh, a part of the contract documents. And then you also need to look to the agreement between the owner and the architect or engineer. Um, and there we'll get more specifics about what the roles and responsibilities of the design professional are versus what the owner's responsibilities are versus the contractors. And then the last place is in the Division One section uh, for payment procedures. It's Division 01-2900. Next slide, Matthew. The contractual responsibilities, uh, we're going to briefly touch on those here. All the parties need to be familiar with what the procedures are that the documents establish and make sure that they are doing their part in the process for getting tabs push through the system so the money can get flowing. Um, the contractor is the party that's responsible for preparing his payment application. He needs to accurately prepare this application, and I put accurately in there. Um, it needs to not be inflated and needs to accurately reflect where he is in the progress of the work. He needs to submit it in accordance with the requirements of the documents in a timely manner. Um, depending on whether I've seen it in general conditions, I've also seen it in the owner contractor agreement. If there are set dates or time periods that are established for submitting that, he needs to make sure he complies with those. He submits it to the architect or the engineer. He also, and this is a requirement that is not only just in the general AI general conditions, it's also in several different state statutes. He also must pay his subcontractors promptly. He may not include requests for payments for work that he does not intend to pay a subcontractor or a supplier for. And by submitting his pay app, he is certifying that the work that was paid under previous pay apps is free of liens and claims. Now, a little bit about paying the subcontractors promptly uh, varies by state. 
North Carolina has a statute that requires uh, the contractor to pay, and there is a certain time period within the statute that they have to comply with. And North Carolina also does not uh, enforce pay when paid clauses in a co contractor's contract. So you need to check your statutes. If you are putting that kind of language in your contracts or in your specifications, make sure that it's in sync with what the uh, statutes of your state are. Do you have anything to add? Well, I just would, uh, you know, in the processing of these applications, one of the things that often happens is, is we talked about here when when uh, the application is prepared, it's for work, it's completed. In some agencies, there are cycles uh, where it can take some period of time from the time a pay application is submitted until that actual payment is received, and I don't know if now is the proper time to talk about that or if possibly we're in, uh, maybe it more applies to payment intervals and, and we can have a, a little deeper discussion about it there, but as Doug pointed out, to be paid for the work, it needs to be complete, and I see us often get ourselves in a bind when we try to help that application along, go ahead and accept it and get it in the queue, so to speak, to help the contractor deal with that time lag uh, from getting that money out of some agency. Of course, once, once you certify it, then you've bought it, and we'll talk about that later, too. But if that interval is something we need to spend some time with. A couple of comments here. Um, Jim, I'm going to ask you to respond to this one. It is from, I'm not going to try to pronounce your name, I'm sorry. But the question is, where can I get a copy of the practice guide? Yes, I tried to answer that, but I must not have done it properly. Uh, and Matthew, you can talk about this too, but I would start with the CSI website. All the practice guides that have been uh, published so far are uh, are indicated there and are available through the, uh, the CSI, go to the CSI homepage and it will direct you to the practice guides and you can order it right there. And I have adjusted how I am speaking, um, so I'm hoping that the sound is better. If it is still an issue, if someone could still send me something. That's a lot better. That's okay. a lot better. Great. Um, from Kevin O'Byrne, he says, courts will deem as enforceable a pay when paid clause. The ones that are often the sticky point are and may be unenforceable in some jurisdictions are the pay if paid if paid clause. Um, they are two different things, pay when paid versus paid if paid, and I don't want to get into the weeds in that too much unless uh, folks want to, but it does vary by jurisdiction, and in North Carolina, neither of those clauses are enforceable. Um, based on, on the uh, state statutes that we have here and our public policy. So you can check your statutes. Um, they vary from state to state, and I know there are some states that do enforce pay when paid clauses. Uh, like I said, North Carolina does not. There's another question here about uh, can we get a copy of the PowerPoint presentation? And Matthew, I think we'll just wait till the end and you can uh, repeat the information about where they can access uh, the presentation after today's session. Um, and with that, we will keep going and move on to the next slide, which talks about the architect's responsibilities in reviewing payment applications. So the architect certifies the amount due to the contractor, and that's based on the architects or engineers' observations of the work in the field, as well as in his evaluation of the information that the contractor has presented in his payment application. 
the AE certification is a represent, representation to the owner that the contractor is entitled to payment for the amounts that he has certified. So the owner is relying on the architect's recommendations or certifications in that pay app for making payment. And when the owner is relying on that, then the architect is bearing some liability for, for that certification that he's making. The architect also, per the AI general conditions, is uh, required to furnish to a subcontractor or supplier information regarding percentages of completion that he is certified in the pay app and that the contra contractor is requested in this pay app. So if a subcontractor were to contact an architect, uh, per the general conditions, the architect is obligated to let that subcontractor know, and that's just for that one subcontractor's piece of work. He doesn't get to ask about everybody else, so he can say, okay, how much has he asked for percentage-wise from for curtain wall? And you are obligated to tell him, well, on his last pay app, he submitted for 35%. Then he can ask you, well, how much did you certify? And if you say 35%, make sure that's what you certify. But that's the information that he can then use as a subcontractor to enforce his rights and make sure that he's getting paid properly. Jim, I'm going to pause here slightly to see if there's anything that you want to uh, add on the architect certifications. No, I, I don't think so, Doug. Um, I think I think you covered it. Uh, I, you know, I, I will just share or make another point of the fact that what you are certifying and representing to the owner as in place is critical to be accurate and puts you in a great deal of responsibility uh, to be sure that it is. And you know, I often start out projects and, and we'll talk about a schedule of values here uh, later. Uh, but making an application reviewable uh, as easily but also as accurately as it can be uh, is a primary goal that I think we all need to focus on in the, in the very early stages of the project. And, and we'll talk about that in more detail here in a few minutes. Kevin asked a question. I'm going to paraphrase. Um, the EJC, EJCDC documents do not require the design professional to, to certify the pay app. The language that they use is recommend. AIA language is certified. Uh, the question is, why would AIA require something more um, assertive, something more, um, it might be more of an obligation than, than just to recommend payment. I don't know that for sure. My guess would be during the course of drafting the documents that there was discussion on this and it was... Um, something that the owners probably pushed for. Um, as you guys are probably aware, those AI documents were developed and continue to develop by committee where the AIA asked owners, representatives, and contractors and subcontractors to come together and they, they hammer out these clauses. So it was probably something that was pushed for and uh, agreed to during those negotiations. So there is a difference. I'm sorry, go ahead, Jim. I was going to say, and it, and it may be uh, also part of the development that has occurred over so many years and uh, the age of the AIA documents versus maybe the EJCDC documents that that language was in there uh, and it has been difficult for the organization to get it removed. Um, because of the litigious nature of construction potentially changing over the years, EJCDC was able to have what, what in my estimation, is a more reasonable 
uh, statement and certification. Um, so it could be just because of the age of the documents and when they were developed. Uh, yeah. And with the certification language in the AIA, they do attempt to clarify that in the general conditions and in the owner uh, architect agreement that the certification is based on that architect's knowledge, information, and belief that the work has progressed to the point indicated and the quantity of work conforms to those that are in the contract document, the requirements of the contract documents. So it specifically says that it does not mean that the architect has made exhaustive site inspections, has reviewed construction means, methods, sequences, or procedures, has reviewed requisitions of subcontractors or suppliers, or has determined that the previous uh, certificates of payments have been dispersed as they are supposed to be spent. So the owner, once he receives a certification or recommendation from the design professional, his obligation is to make payment. He's got to pay the contractor, and he needs to do that on or before the time that's established in the contract. Typically, the ownership of the work that's the subject of that pay application, the title to the, to the material passes to the owner upon the time of payment and the payment does not constitute acceptance of the work. So neither the architect nor the owner is responsible for verifying that payments are made to subcontractors or suppliers. And I'm not seeing any questions on the owner's obligations. So I did want to mention briefly joint checks. Um, oftentimes we will see where an issue arises where a subcontractor or a contractor in some cases may ask the owner to issue a joint check. I just want to comment that I would never make that recommendation to the owner to do that, but I also would not oppose it. That's something that needs to be worked out between the owner and the contractor. Um, they can be useful in helping to keep the project moving, to keep money flowing to where it needs to be flowing to, but it's not something that I would want to be liable for making a recommendation that a joint check be issued to a subcontractor or supplier. Go to the next slide if we don't have anything else. Payment intervals. Typically, your contract documents will define the payment intervals. Periodic payments uh, usually are done on a monthly basis depending on the type of work, size of the project, that could be increased to twice monthly or even weekly. Uh, monthly is typically what I see and uh, typically what we deal with. Provisional payments are predetermined partial payments tied to identifiable and obtainable uh, milestones. So. Um, That could be set to where at building dry-in, there's going to be a payment at startup of HVAC systems, there's going to be a payment. So you identify milestones and tie the payments to those specific milestones. The single payment is on and small projects. Be, I'm sorry, Jim, are you? Uh, right. I was going to say, and, and I don't know if this is where we would uh, cover that, but in some cases, that we're experiencing on projects where uh, there's a required down payment, uh, even with uh, state-funded projects, for example, ordering the elevator or uh, producing shop drawings for certain systems in the building, and they're becoming more prevalent in the projects that this is really is a down payment to 
production of or creation of. And I guess those may be considered as provisional payments that may show up in your schedule as milestones uh, that would get processed. Yeah, I have seen that, at least here in North Carolina, where the elevator manufacturers are looking for this down payment. And uh, even prior to submitting shop drawings, and so those those type of, of situations, especially if you know you can have an elevator and you're dealing with that, you might want to work out with your contractor ahead of time. And then the single payment is on small projects. When uh, projects done, they get paid in one single payment. Matthew, next slide. How do we measure the pain? I, I think we need to back up one, Matthew. There you go. Got ahead of got ahead of ourselves. Basis for payment. Generally, there's the three there's three um, basis for payment. The first one we're talking about is the stipulated sum. It's also called lump sum. That's the one that I see most often. It's uh, an agreed upon contract amount for the total cost of the work. If uh, a change occurs, then you would do the change order, and that change order amount would then increase the stipulated sum amount by the amount of that change order. Unit price is uh, where the actual quantity of the work is measured and the price is based upon an agreed upon unit price rate. That's probably more common to civil engineering type projects where the quantities can be measured upon completion but may not be able to be determined at the time of, of the additional pricing of or entering into the construction contract. And then there's the cost plus fee where the contractor's paid his actual cost for labor equipment materials and so forth and on top of that he'll get a predetermined fee or a predetermined percentage cost of the total construction cost. That's the, that's the total of the actual cost. So it might be 10% of his expenditures for labor, equipment, materials and it's all of his uh, expenses. That can be structured in a couple of different ways. Over in private could be included in that percentage where um, the 10% covers all of his over in private. I've also seen some where you do a cost plus a fee plus a different percentage for a profit. I've seen some situations where and it's typically been in a CM type situation where some of this kind of gets mixed up. Um, you may agree to some unit pricing on some work that you don't know, but still have a set uh, stipulated fee knowing that you're going to have a change order for this unit price cost work that, that's going to come up that you don't uh, know at the time what the actual, actual quantities are going to be. So to measure the work that's been done for the stipulated sum contract, the progress payments are related to the schedule of values. I'm going to talk about the schedule of values in a bit. For unit price contracts, the project, the progress payments are made based on the actual work in place. You actually measure or count the units. You've got the agreed upon unit price. You do the math. That's what the uh, payment application is going to be for. For a cost plus fee, the contractor will submit receipts, invoices for the materials, equipment, payroll for his labor that he's used, 
as part of this progress payment, and then on top of that, help get his markup of uh, whatever that percentage is that's been agreed to. I would just add here, Doug, one of the things that we don't talk about is a congregation or uh, our, our fees uh, as far as our fees for services. But I'll just say that when you are in the early phases of uh, working out a project with your owner, it's critical to understand many different variables and details, and this can be one that is, is very important to that early negotiation. The process of doing a cost plus a fee, depending on what your client's expectations are, can be extremely onerous. Um, and, 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 and then again, depends uh, also on the contractor that you end up working with and the extent to which the components are broken down in the building. So it's an example of how we've got to be very, very sure that we pay attention to how we work with our individual clients. Next slide. Brief discussion about retainage. Retainage is a percentage of the amount due that's withheld from the contractor's payment. Historically, I think typically it's been 10%. More recently, there have been some states, and I think the federal government as well, has reduced that to 5% on private projects it can be whatever the parties agree to. Um, retainers is not used to force the contractor to perform work. Uh, it's not an insurance policy. It's not for correcting defective work. The purpose of it is to protect the owner against errors in, in estimating the value of the work that's being completed. Um, retainage typically can be reduced as some Stone, which is usually 50%, and then it's usually paid in full with the final payment application. I know I've had several projects where I get the pay app, I'm looking it over, there's line items where they're billing for 100% of something and they're only 80% done. And then the contractor will turn around and say, well, you got thousands of dollars in retainage, I'm going to have it there next week. If that happens to you, you should not make that certification and say, okay, well, the retainers are there to cover it. That's not what retainers is for. It's not for damage to defective or non-conforming work. So if the work is not completed and he's asking for 100% and it's 80%, you need to get him to either change his pay up to 80% or mark it up so that it's uh, only... 80% that you're certifying. It also should not be used as a ransom for close on documents. And we're going to talk about schedule of values here in a bit. But close on documents should have their own line item on the pay app, and retainage is not a line item set aside for close on documents. I'm looking at a question here from Kevin. If owner and contractor agree to release some retainage before the contract says to do so, the sense of surety to partial release of retainage should be obtained. I agree with that, but it would go further to say that whenever you are releasing retainage at the whether it's prior to these milestones or at that milestone or at the end of the new job. You need to get that consent for surety because that retainage is also there to protect uh, the surety. Your contract will require, as 
releases from the surety company and if you don't provide them then you're putting yourself at risk to the claim from from the surety that's a good point next slide Schedule of values. The schedule of values is an itemization of the cost of the work. It allocates um, a dollar amount to different portions of, of the work, and it should total up to the total contract sum amount. Um, typically, it's divided up using the master format, CSI master format or your specification sessions was typically based on the master format. So each line item has a value that's proportionate to the fraction of the total value of the project. And for further care clarification, you can have it broken down into labor and materials. Um, I would strongly encourage you to do so, especially for items that may be delivered and stored on site but not yet installed so that you can uh, more accurately be uh, making your certifications for payment if you've got a hospital and it's got hundreds of doors and the contractor gets the shipment and he's got two trailers full of doors out there and he doesn't have labor materials broken down separately it's going to be tough to look at a huge number and make that accurate determination that okay half of its labor half of its material you need to get that broken out so you can uh, be realistic in making your certifications. The values on these pay apps need to be realistic. Um, we require that this schedule of values be submitted prior to the first pay app so we can review them. Um, you want to make sure that the contractor is not front end loading his uh, schedule of values to where he's getting paid up front in advance for work because um, that can cause you problems in the end. One thing that I typically do is break, have him break the schedule of values up to smaller chunks of work so that they are easily identif identifiable. You can do it by floors, you can do it by wings, you can do it by faces of, of, of the work. So that you can, I mean, again, the purpose is to accurately pay him for the work that's done. And so by having a chunk, and you can look at the first floor, yeah, he's done with everything on the first floor. And if that's a separate line item, it's easy to say, yeah, that's 100% complete. As opposed to having drywall on all floors in one item, and he's maybe 100% on the first floor, maybe 10% on the second floor, and then 30 on the fifth floor, and then you gotta go through and try to figure out well, what's that total percentage. If you do it by floors and those smaller chunks, it's kinda easier to keep track of. Uh, I think that's right. Uh, this is where uh, time spent early on will save a great deal of time later, and it seems to be one of the spots you know, where at the early parts of the job, there is pushback and disagreement. I often think the construction community wants to be sure they're able to, uh, I won't say hide, but camouflage their overhead and profit. And as Doug described, it's, it's easy to get overhead and profit on big numbers, uh, like a steel package, so they uh, typically get their money out of the job early so that they've got funds to operate with. But it, it certainly, in, in my experience, makes the processing of an application much smoother when I can look at what's there and it has some definable parameters that can help me, you know, with moving that application forward. And I guess I would say the, the more time spent arguing, if, if that's where you have to go with this, uh, to get a detailed breakdown, uh, 
the better that time is spent uh, because it certainly will quicken things up as the project moves forward. And, and I focus and try to talk about that in uh, pre-bid meetings uh, and in certainly pre-construction meetings uh, that you know, that's my expectation and if we can make this easy and my goal is to process payments quickly because I know that's what makes the construction world go round. Uh, one other thing I would add from maybe North Carolina perspective, uh, certainly maybe federal perspective, as we break down these applications, uh, I mean the schedule of values, if you have historically underutilized businesses that are a part of the project with a mandate or goals of participation, line items uh, need to show up in the application that exactly match those contracts with those uh, those businesses so that if and when audits are done, then the auditors are able to tag the contract amount for the historically underutilized business directly to an amount uh, in the PAP application. Yes, and, and to go further with these breakdowns, typically you will explain how you want it broken down in your Division I payment procedures spec section. So if you want it by phase, if you want it by floor, if you want it by wings of the building, you can specifically tell them that in Division One, and it becomes a contract requirement. The way they break it down in terms of the different spec sections so that you don't get one line item, this is mechanical, they break it up for distribution, uh, air handling units, and all the different parts and pieces. You put that in Division One, and it's a part of the contract requirements, and they have to comply. And as Jim was saying, have those discussions up front. When you get that schedule of values, so everybody's on the same page, it makes this process go a whole lot smoother. There's a comment here from, and again, I'm going to pass on the name, but the comment says, speaking as an electrical engineer, when we're working as a consultant to an architect, it would be nice for the architect to share the schedule of values with us and ask, <coughs> excuse me, ask us if it's broken down in such a way that it can be checked by us when we're asked to check the path. And that it isn't just a single line item that says electrical. Um, the fact that he's saying that seems to indicate that there are some of us that aren't either passing the information along, getting the feedback from the consultants, or aren't even looking at the schedule of values ourselves once we get them. Um, I know I would never allow a line item to say electrical and not have it broken down into the person leases or HVAC or plumbing. And I do oftentimes see that the first pass through on the schedule of values, the contractor will say, well, that's it's all one contract to one guy. Well, that may be the case, but you still have to break it down so we can make these evaluations when we're certifying these pay apps. Can we uh, go to the next slide? When we review the schedule of values, uh, it is not our role or the owner's role to dictate to the contractor what those line items cost should be. Um, we examine them for obvious omissions or errors, but we are not dictating what those numbers should be. As an example, before I go on, um, I had a pay up come in once where it was obvious that it was running loaded and the upfront work was valued higher than it should have been and then the tail end work, the landscaping, was a lot lower than it should have been. So when I gave my comments to that contractor, I noted this line item, this line item, this line item, they appear quite high, they need to be adjusted down. These three or four line items over here appear low, you need to make the adjustment. I did not tell him what that adjustment should be. Like, like I was saying, you don't dictate to him what those prices are. We 
have some discussions. He had a pushback, and he got to the point where he got irritated and said, well, just tell me what you want. And I told him, no, I'm not doing that. That's not my job. That's not the purpose here. You just need to put fair and accurate numbers down. And as Jim was saying, we went through that up front, came to an agreement, and for the rest of that project, everything went smoothly. So when there is a disagreement, you can request supporting documentation that's in the general conditions to substantiate the cost that he is claiming on his schedule of values, be that his subs quotes, uh, contracts that he's got with the subs and Mr. Material Suppliers, his, his bid forms that he used to put his bid together. The general conditions allow you to ask for that information so you can make sure that that schedule of values is accurate. Um, I think it's a good idea to separate the general condition requirements list those as line items such as um, bond, insurance, mobilization, permits, um, final cleaning, um, temporary facilities. Break those things out as separate line items. Again, it just helps facilitate your review and your estimate when you're uh, in any way in this pay apps. And then change orders, if they are included into the scope of work, I like for them to be added at the end of the schedule of values as separate line items. And if the scope of work for that change order is large enough or complicated enough and is out involves several trades, then that change order also needs to get broken up into its own separate line items. Doug, look, let me ask a question that is worth, I'd like to just throw out for everyone to have a chance to comment on, and, and maybe this is food for thought for the next conversation, the uh, next, next webinar. I have, uh, in, in talking about general condition requirements and breaking that, that line item down into multiple line items, what what is the opinion of individuals about the precedent that you established there? And I'll I'll summarize that question like this: I have been unfortunately at the table for conversations on projects that ran over the original schedule, and and trying to establish whose whose fault that was. Uh, did I have some uh, responsibility for it running over? Was it the contractor's poorly managed schedule for planning? Was it the fault of suppliers for materials that the contractor couldn't control? Did the owner change her mind and make something be different so the schedule got extended? Then came the question, well, since you accepted these general condition requirements as line items in the application for payment, you agreed that this is how much it cost us to operate every day on the project. And so we'll just take that number and multiply it by another 150 for that many days you know, we had to stay, and here is now our change order proposal for X of hundreds of thousands of dollars in general condition monies. And, and it became a fight uh, from the position that since we had been working together for a year and a half, we obviously understood what that expense was to the contractor on a daily basis because it was documented right there in his pay application. Curious how everybody feels about a position like that, if they've had that experience and what kind of comments they may have uh, on that. And certainly, Doug, you too, if you add anything to that if you want to, just be curious. And if anybody wants to comment, uh, you can either type in the chat box or raise your hand so Matthew can get with you so we can, we can hear. Uh, what you have to say. I am of the opinion that if 
through no fault of the contractor, the time is extended and he is granted a time extension that he is entitled to additional general conditions to go along with that. Um, I don't necessarily agree that you take the number that he had before and divide it by the number of days or weeks or whatever that you, you want to use and then you use that to extend out for the number of days or weeks or whatever that's added on. Um, I think just like with any other change order item, those general conditions need to be supported and documented and backed up with proper documentation. Um, an example is, depending on how you have your general conditions listed in your schedule of values, you could just say general conditions and it could include everything and you don't have um, power requirements and temporary utilities and toilets and all that stuff broken out. But at some point you get to the job, you may get to a point on the job where the contractor removes his trailer and he's using the space in the building. So he doesn't have that trailer cost. Um, items like that don't necessarily carry through on a cost per day basis for every day that you're out there on the job site. So I do think that uh, he's entitled to additional general conditions. I just don't necessarily agree that you take the original number and say this is divided by the number of days is the cost per day and that's what you use. All right, this is, um, yeah. Um, Kevin has his hand raised, so Kevin, I'm gonna unmute your line. Um, so hopefully, Kevin, can you hear us? Yeah, yeah, can you hear me? We can hear you. Yeah, I, I just want to say I, I endorse what was just being said about, you know, that the if it's through no fault of the contractor, that the contractor is probably due some additional cost uh, in addition to uh, an extension of the contract time, um, and that uh, it does not necessarily go without saying, or it's not necessarily a foregone conclusion, perhaps, is a better way to put it that uh, the contractor just gets an extension of whatever cost he had previously had in the schedule of values. It obviously has to be, you know, particular to the certain circumstances and the situation at the time. Uh, I had a project uh, uh, not quite completed with construction at the moment where we had uh, last autumn an owner uh, ordered suspension of a good portion of the work due to the failure to obtain a permit. and. Uh, of course, when one of the prime contractors uh, submitted the inevitable delay claim, <clears throat> he had uh, something like 14 weeks of additional project management. Given the fact we could hardly get him to answer the phone when we were trying to call him, we weren't sure what kind of additional project management costs uh, he was thinking he was entitled to, but he was just taking a direct extension of what he had in the schedule of values. And, uh, and, and of course, we had a, a bit of a disagreement over how much he was entitled there. So you know, I support what was being said. Um, uh, on a separate subject, I had another question, but I don't want to kind of muddy the waters here uh, uh, on this particular topic, so I'm, I guess I'll hold that. Thank you, Kevin. Any other hands raised, Matthew? There are no other hands at this moment. Okay. Let's move on to the next slide which talks about the application for payment itself. Typically, uh, I use the AIA document G702 with G703 continuation sheet. The G703 is the sheet where these line items are listed out and their dollar values are, are assigned. That becomes a part of the pay app with the G702 that's the, the front page. The EGC document is the C620. Um, the contractor prepares the application and as he prepares it, he is actually certifying that the work that is covered by that pay app conforms with the requirements of the contract documents. And he's also uh, certifying that he has made payments based on the previous payments that he's received to his subsequent suppliers. Um, with his pay app, he may need to submit other supporting documentation. Uh, typically, we'll ask for an updated construction schedule. You may need to submit sales tax reports, 
test reports, uh, lead documentation, there's any a number of things that's tied to that pay app. Um, to have them at the same time. Next slide. Doug, while we're going to the next slide, one of the things that I try to make a habit of doing um, during my site observations is to talk about payment. I, I talk about this in the pre-construction conference and you know, just let folks know that it's something that, that I'm going to chat about. I want to be sure the money is flowing as it should. And I know that some have had the experience that they get that signed and authorized uh, payment of debts and claims and release of liens when, in fact, that is a false document. And while I'm not trying to say that we're obligated because someone provided us accurate information, I think it's a good idea to follow up with folks on the job to be sure that they are being paid. I would agree with that. And I want to uh, read a comment here. It goes back to Jim, your last uh, question. Says, in my opinion, it's easier if the general commissions are broken out individual line, into individual line items and you don't just have one huge dollar amount. This is general conditions. So in the event that there is a time extension and the contractor is entitled to additional, to additional uh, payment, then only those line items that would be applicable is what's used for the value in determining the time extension. And I can paraphrase that a bit. So on to uh, the next slide, application for payments. Um, this even hopefully we'll address the question from Kevin earlier and Kevin if not you can you can chime in um, that payment applications typically is for work that is in place or materials that are stored on the project site it may include payment for materials stored off site if it's permitted by your general conditions and your owner and typically what I've seen is if an owner is going to require or permit for a contractor to be paid for materials that are not stored on site, they typically have to be stored in a bonded warehouse that's close to the project site. Typically they'll ask for proof of insurance, copies of receipts or other proof that the items have been paid for, title or ownership of those items will transfer to the owner upon payment. Uh, items are inventory and clearly marked that they are for this owner for this particular project. And typically they need to be reviewed by the architect or engineer at that facility where they're stored. Um, the one major somewhat exception to that that I've come across in my practice has been for precast concrete. Um, Typically, because of the nature and the size of that stuff, it is stored at the precaster facility. They don't ship it from there to the body warehouse and to the job site. Um, but that is probably the only atypical major exception to having uh, the material stored in a body warehouse. Uh, be aware that if you're going to have an owner that agrees to pay for stuff stored off-site, um, and he's going to require you to go look at it, that is not standard services. That should be additional services for your time and expenses to go look at that stuff. Um, also, you might want to caution your owner about him a green space material stored off-site that are in another state. And that opens a whole another can of worms in terms of priorities and who can get access to stuff if it's not within the state that the project is in, if the owner's in, uh, trying to reach across state, state lines and get property uh, in case of a default is next to impossible. And, and I would add uh, the you know, we're again going back to the conversation about early contract negotiations, depending on the type of project you're doing and the type of warehousing that is being done, 
uh, and the way that that's facilitated through a particular owner. If, for example, you're doing a hotel and you're working you know, for, a, for a chain of hotels, uh, the way that they bring in materials and store them through a modded warehouse situation is typically not such that you can get access to see anything. It may be just in box containers. And so when you're establishing how you're going to, if you're using AIA documents, certify pay applications uh, for a warehouse full of plywood uh, 10 by 10 boxes stacked to the ceiling, then it's pretty critical to get that established up front and you don't find yourself in a spot where you're obligated to do this because you didn't specifically denote that you know, your contract didn't cover that sort of review. Um, it, it just can't express enough how important it is for you to lay your eyes on what you're certifying and in the next webinar we're going to talk a little bit about that uh, and maybe share, share some horror stories. So uh, that pretty much wraps up what we had on the agenda for today. As Jim mentioned, next month, July 22nd, we will uh, continue this discussion. We'll get into the architects and engineers review of the payment application, withholding payments, failure to make payments, liens, liquidated damages, what happens to substantial completion, and what happens to final payment. And considering uh, all those topics that may run over into uh, August as well. So July will definitely pick up where we left off. And depending on uh, how far we get in in July, we may pick up on this again in August. A uh, couple of closing notes. Kevin had noted on a previous comment that there are many jurisdictions that do have a maximal, maximum amount of retainage on private projects. So again, when you're dealing with retainers, check to see what your uh, local statutes say. And he had a comment here asking us to comment on the practice of using cost and resource loaded project schedules as a basis for determining the amount eligible for payment. So we will pick that up as we talk about the AE review for pay apps next month. Um, if anyone else has any topics that they want us to discuss, related to pay apps or any other other uh, subject matter, please let us know. Uh, if we can get to the last slide, it will show Jim's email address and my email address. And uh, shoot us your comments, questions, and we'll be glad to address them for you. There, there it is. So again, we'll pick up on July 22nd, uh, continuing our discussion about payment applications. All right. Thank you, Douglas and Jim.